All right, so we're talking about Anglican polity today. Um, and this, this is one of those things that it may not sound all that important or all that exciting, but the more I talk with people, the more I learn about uh, the way other, some other churches do things, the more I see the beauty in the way the Anglican system is set up. And it's certainly not perfect as we have learned um, through our most recent history, but it's a, it's a good system, and if it's done properly, it works really well. So, the first thing we have to understand is that Anglicanism is not a denomination, but rather it's a worldwide communion of Christians. And so you can see that Anglicanism uh, has spread throughout most of the world. And I think it's the third largest Christian group uh, after the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's very different than those churches. So although Anglicanism originated in England, it's now a worldwide church, and it's made up of roughly... 40 autonomous geographically based provinces. Now, I say roughly 40 because that number is changing and those definitions are changing a bit. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that uh, perhaps a little more towards the end. But the fact that we have the ACNA, the Anglican Church of North America and the Episcopal Church in the United States and the Anglican Church of Canada all operating in the same geographic region um, makes this a little tougher to define. But I think the important part here is that the provinces within Anglicanism are autonomous. And that's really one of the things that sets us apart from, say, the Roman Catholic Church. The, the Roman Catholic Church is very centralized. And so the Pope and the um, the cardinals and the magisterium, they can make decisions that are binding for the entirety of Roman Catholicism around the world. In Anglicanism, each province governs itself. <clears throat> and so the Church of England makes decisions, but those decisions aren't binding on any other province throughout the world. And in some ways, that's a blessing, and in some ways, that's a curse. Uh, it, it can be a blessing in that we don't have to do what the Church of England does. And so when they approve things that aren't biblical, we don't have to abide by that. At the same time, it causes a bit of a, a Lone Ranger mentality. And we saw that in the Episcopal Church, where the majority of the communion was saying one thing, and the Episcopal Church was going in a completely opposite direction. And, and there was really no way to, to call them to account for what they had done. Um, and so I think we're eventually going to see a split in the Anglican communion, and those fractures have already started. But for now, we have these 40 autonomous provinces throughout the world, and they're by and large based on geography. And the demographics of the communion have shifted significantly in the past hundred years. If we look at this uh, 100 years ago, we see that the majority of Anglicans were in Great Britain. And then you had sort of a, a smattering of, of other Anglicans around the world. Now, the, the population of Anglicanism has shifted dramatically to Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's where you'll find the majority of Anglicans in the world. And this graph is still a bit um, misleading because we show 33% of the world's Anglicans in Great Britain. And the problem with that number is if you're a British citizen, you're technically considered an Anglican. Uh, so that 33%, I, I don't believe represents actual practicing, believing Anglicans. Uh, but we see that the, uh, the demographics have shifted to the south, um, and it's predominantly African now. 
so how is this communion bound together with the catholic church everything is bound together through the pope and the pope has authority over all of the church but that's not the case in anglicanism so what is it that binds our communion together we have what are known as the instruments of unity uh, and these sort of traditional instruments of unity have always been the Archbishop of Canterbury, what's known as the Lambeth Conference, and the Lambeth Conference is a conference that's called by the Archbishop of Canterbury every 10 years, uh, where he invites all of the Anglican bishops around the world to come to Lambeth Palace, where the Archbishop of Canterbury lives, for a meeting. And oftentimes at this meeting, they they can't make binding decisions for individual provinces within the communion, but they can make decisions as to what the mind of the communion is. So, for example, in 1998, they had a resolution on sexuality where they came up with sort of this is the communion definition of human sexuality. This is the biblical definition. Um, the problem is that they can vote on that resolution, but it's not binding on any province. And so certain provinces said, well, we don't like that definition and we're not going to abide by it. Um, now, Lambeth Conference, I believe, was supposed to be uh, last year or two years ago. I think it was supposed to be in 2018. But because of everything that's happening in the communion, and all the, the discord, Justin Welby, who's the current Archbishop of Canterbury, refused to call the meeting because calling the meeting, basically whatever bishops are invited, that kind of tells you who's in and who's out. And, and Welby didn't want to make any of those decisions, and so uh, he simply postponed it, and they were going to have it this year, but now because of the coronavirus, they've postponed it again. Um, the primates meeting, now this is not a meeting of a bunch of monkeys, um, but we refer to the archbishop or the head of each province within the communion as primates. And so the primates meeting, this is the gathering of, of all of the, the primates throughout the communion. Um, and this is really where the the bulk of the unity within the communion now comes from, is from the primates meeting. Uh, but they have been contentious, to say the least, in the past 10, maybe 15 years. Uh, for example, we had um, a new primate of, I believe, Uganda, who was enthroned a few weeks ago. And up on the the stage at the at the enthronement, you had Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and you had uh, Foley Beach, who is the Archbishop of the ACNA. Um, and the Archbishop of Canterbury does not recognize uh, Foley Beach as an Anglican bishop, and yet it was Foley Beach who preached at this uh, enthronement of a new Archbishop. So th there's lots of posturing going on. Uh, in the midst of all this. And then finally, you have a group that's known as the Anglican Consultative Council, and they're made up of, of laity and clergy from around the world uh, who, who meet to sort of discuss issues of common life within the communion. But lately, these instruments have become shaky at best. We see that the Archbishop of Canterbury, the last two archbishops, have not been strong leaders, and so things have started to crumble under them. We see Lambeth Conference keeps getting postponed and postponed. The Anglican Consultative Council is stacked with, uh, with members from more liberal um, uh, provinces. And so it's really the primates meeting that's the only thing right now that's holding it together. And, and I'm not sure how much longer that's going to hold together. So let's take a look at the structure of a province within Anglicanism. So at the provincial level, 
you have the archbishop and the archbishop is sort of the head of all of the bishops within a particular province. So our archbishop is Foley Beach. And so not only is he our diocesan bishop, he is the bishop for the entirety of the ACNA. And so he is given authority over all the bishops. Then within a province, it's broken into what have traditionally been geographical regions known as dioceses. And each diocese has its own bishop. And the bishop serves essentially as the CEO of the diocese. Um, what's interesting within the ACNA, and this has a lot to do with how the ACNA itself formed, um, but we have a number of what are called now non-geographical or affinity dioceses. And so these are dioceses that aren't based on geographical regions, but more um, kind of churchmanship or a particular interest or focus of the group. So one of the, one of the largest of the, these non-geographic dioceses is called Church for the Sake of Others. And it's really, it's a bunch of people that um, are really focused on church planting and planting new churches. Um, and they're spread out throughout the whole of the United States. Uh, one of the things that that we did at All Saints, we really wanted, and the bishops really want to move us into more of a geographical uh, setup for our diocese because it works better. You're able to do the things that dioceses are supposed to do when you're closer to each other. And so that's why uh, a year ago we moved out of the diocese of Pittsburgh, which made no sense for us geographically, and moved into the diocese of the South. Uh, which is much closer to where we are. Then within each diocese, you have parishes. And a parish is just a local body or a church. And the head of a parish is the rector. And a rector is a priest. So not all priests are rectors, but all rectors are priests. And so the, the rector is the head priest or the senior pastor within a parish. And then within a parish, uh, the bishop is technically the head of every parish. And so mm -hmm. the, the bishop is technically our senior pastor, but because the bishop has many parishes that he oversees, uh, the rector is sort of that mm -hmm. lieutenant on the ground that makes the decisions and runs the day-to-day -day operations of a parish. And so the rector runs the parish with the vestry and the vestry is our lay board and a vestry is is different than a board of elders um, the vestry is not a, a what we would call a ruling board um, they are in charge of the the temporal matters of the church and there are officers within the vestry known as wardens and we're going to talk a little more about that later uh, but the, the vestry does not make decisions on worship and preaching and what songs we're going to sing and uh, things like that. The vestry really manages the budget and the facility. And then the rector is in charge of the spiritual life of the church. And so the rector has authority over the assisting clergy and the staff. So everyone on the staff works for the rector. They don't work for the vestry. And then the rector works for the bishop. All right, so let's talk about orders of ministry. This is one of uh, the distinctives in Anglicanism that sets us apart from many of our Protestant brothers, um, is that we retain the threefold ministry of the ancient church. So there's the deacon. And so everyone who's ordained is first ordained to the diaconate. And this is a ministry of service. And so the job of the deacon is to bring the needs of the world to the church and then bring the gospel of the church out to the world. And so liturgically, deacons read the gospel at Holy Communion and they prepare the altar. And these two jobs of the deacon 
uh, really are meant to represent what the deacon's job is outside of the worship service, which is to serve and to be a proclaimer of the gospel in the world. So deacons cannot consecrate the elements or give a priestly blessing. So you, uh, uh, a deacon can't preside at communion. You can do what's known as a, a deacon's communion, which is you do the whole first part of the service and, and then the deacon can distribute elements that have already been consecrated. But a deacon cannot consecrate the bread and the wine for communion. A deacon can't give the blessing. A deacon can't pronounce the absolution. Now, there have traditionally been two types of deacons. You have what are known as transitional deacons, and then you have what are known as permanent deacons. So a transitional deacon is usually someone who is pursuing uh, priestly orders. And so they will first be ordained as a deacon for traditionally six months to a year, and then they're ordained to the priesthood. Uh, but then there are other deacons who are permanent deacons. They don't have a call to the priesthood <clears throat> and, and simply have a call to remain as a deacon in that servant ministry. So Deacon DJ and Deacon Robert are both permanent deacons. They're, they're not pursuing ordination to the priesthood. Um, but for those of you who were around when Father Nathaniel was first ordained, you'll remember that he was ordained to, as a deacon first and spent um, six or seven months as a deacon before he became a priest. Deacons are typically non-stipendiary. It's usually a volunteer ministry. That, that doesn't mean you can't pay a deacon, um, but it just means that usually they serve as volunteers. And in worship, the deacon wears his stole over his left shoulder. And this is just a symbol of, of that servant role. Next, we have the priest. And this is perhaps the most common order for parish ministry. So anyone who's been in an Anglican parish has had a priest. Not everyone has had a deacon. And actually, when I was in... Colorado Springs for years we didn't have a deacon so it was a bit of an adjustment for me when I suddenly had two uh, shortly after I came to to Springfield so it took a little getting used to but most most people when they think of the Anglican pastor it's the the priest that they have in mind and the priesthood is primarily a liturgical order now that doesn't mean that that's all that the priest does but it means that's what really sets the priest apart. Um, so the, the priest will often do pastoral ministry and the priest will often do administrative duties and teaching, but all of those other things can be done by lay people as well. Um, and so, but you need a priest for certain liturgical functions within the church. So a priest can preside at the Eucharist or Holy Communion, a priest can preside at weddings and baptisms and funerals. And he wears a stole over both of his shoulders. Sometimes they'll cross the, the stole at the waist, um, but this is a symbol of the authority that the priest has been given in the church. And a priest can pronounce the absolution and give the priestly blessing in the absence of a bishop. And so if a bishop is present, the priest will defer to the bishop for the absolution and the priestly blessing. Finally, we have the bishops. And a bishop's primary duty is leadership, which is designated by the bishop's crook or crozier. And you'll see the, in this picture the bishop on the right, who is Peter Akinola, who it's the former Archbishop of Nigeria. You can see he's holding his crozier in his hand. So that's a symbol of his leadership and his authority. And the bishop is the primary defender of the faith. And that's really the most important job of the bishop is to defend the faith against error and heresy. 
um, which works really well as long as you've got orthodox Bible-believing bishops. As soon as you don't have Bible-believing bishops, the whole system breaks down. So a bishop is required for confirmation and ordination. So when people are confirmed or received into the church, a bishop is required, and a bishop is required for ordination. And this is one of the ways that the bishops are meant to protect orthodoxy is by making sure that they're only ordaining orthodox Bible-believing people into the ministry of the diaconate and the priesthood. And then three bishops are needed to consecrate a new bishop. And again, this is sort of more protection to make sure we're not bringing in uh, heretical bishops into the house of bishops. So you may be able to get a guy past one bishop, but the hope is that if, if it's three bishops, they're all gonna look into it and make sure that this person is really qualified to be a bishop in the church. And the, as I said before, the bishop is technically the head of each parish in his diocese. And only a bishop may wear purple. So anytime you see someone wearing a purple shirt, that means that he is a bishop. And then there, there are different types of bishops. You have the diocesan bishop, who is the, the bishop of a diocese. He's the one in charge. Um, but if, if it's a large diocese, either in terms of population or in terms of geography, um, a diocese can elect what's known as a suffragan bishop. And a suffragan bishop is someone who assists the bishop um, but doesn't have ultimate authority in, in a diocese. There are also what are known as assisting bishops. And the difference between a suffragan and an assisting bishop is an assisting bishop is typically a bishop who's already been consecrated, who is called by the diocesan bishop, whereas a suffragan bishop is elected by the, by the diocese, the people in the diocese. So in our Diocese of the South, we have uh, Archbishop Foley Beach, but because he's often doing provincial things, we have an assisting bishop named Frank Lyons, who was the bishop, I think, of Bolivia for a long time. Um, but he now serves as the assisting bishop. So he does a lot of the things that Archbishop Foley simply doesn't have the time to do. All right, titles and tasks. This is always a fun one to talk about because I think there, there can be a lot of confusion here. So the first one <clears throat> is the, ti uh, the title, the reverend. And you hear people often referring to people as Reverend Tom or Reverend Smith. Um, but reverend is actually, it's a title, but it's not a form of address. Uh, so back in the old days, um, they would refer to a pastor or a priest as the Reverend Mr. Johnson, um, but not Reverend Johnson. Um, and so, so Reverend is not meant to be a form of address. Now, an archbishop is typically referred to as the most reverend. A bishop is the right reverend, and a canon or a dean is the very reverend. Um, and then if you're just a rector like me, you're just the normal reverend. So my, so my title would be the Reverend Eric Zollner, um, Much but, I'm, but I'm typically not referred to as Reverend Eric or Reverend Zollner. Um, we'll, we'll use the, um, the, the form of address as father, usually for priests. Now, some dioceses have what are known as archdeacons, and this would be a senior priest in a diocese to whom the bishop has designated a specific leadership duty. Uh, when I was in the Nigerian church, we had a lot, lot of archdeacons. Um, it's, not, not as, uh, it's not something we use a whole lot within the American church, but a lot of other Anglican bodies will use archdeacons as special assistants for the bishop. 
And the title for an archdeacon is the venerable. <clears throat> and then finally, a canon is a person who works directly for the bishop in some specific capacity. So when I was in the Church of Nigeria, I served my bishop as the canon examiner. So I was in charge of all the, the ordinands and gave the, the ordination exam um, and things like that. So, so I was a canon um, in Nigeria. Okay, so within the parish, you have what's known as the rector. And that comes from, um, I believe it's Latin for king, might be Greek. But this is the senior, par so the senior pastor of a parish. And the rector is typically called by the vestry, but must be approved by the bishop. So as Anglicans, when we call, when a rector is called, he's not called by the congregation. Um, there's no congregational vote as there would be in perhaps a Baptist church uh, to call a pastor. So it's the vestry that makes the decision with the approval of the bishop. Um, when I came to All Saints, they actually had me come in and do a question and answer with the entire congregation, which I'll admit kind of shocked me because I'd never seen that done within Anglicanism before. Usually the congregation doesn't meet the new rector until after he's already been called. Um, a vicar is either a senior associate to a rector or the pastor of a mission church. And so Father Nathaniel, now that he is the head of our mission congregation, his official title is vicar. And then a curate is a newly ordained priest, usually in his first parish. So before Father Nathaniel was the vicar, he was really our curate. So those are just some terms you'll hear thrown about. The vestry is the lay leadership body of the parish. And within the vestry, you typically have four uh, officers. You have the senior warden, who's the head of the vestry, um, the junior warden, who's kind of vice president. Oftentimes, the junior warden is in charge of the building and facilities, the treasurer, mm -hmm. and the clerk. Um, and, and vestries can be anywhere from, I think, nine to 12 people. So our vestry is technically nine, but we appointed a junior warden from outside of our vestry. So we have 10 people on our vestry now. And the vestry is elected by members of the congregation, usually to three year, staggered three year terms. And so every three years we elect a new, uh, three new people to our vestry. And the vestry is responsible for the temporal matters of the church. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll open it up for some questions. Um, any I questions? Was wondering if uh, any of jobs can be held by ladies in ah. US. <laughs> That's a good question, yes. So, um, it's not a simple question to answer. Um, within the ACNA, we have a variety of views of women's ordination. And, and in terms of kind of lay ministry, um, for the most part, that's open to, to all members of the church, male and female. Um, so like on our vestry, we have men on our vestry, we have women on our vestry. Uh, we have men and women leading different ministries um, throughout the church. But in terms of ordained ministry, there are really three different... Um, hold on, let me turn my light on so you guys see me a little better. We've got three different ways different dioceses do it. And within the ACNA, um, this is an issue where we don't have common agreement. And so it's been left to each bishop and each diocese to make uh, decisions on this. So um, you have certain dioceses that um, ordain uh, women to the diaconate and the priesthood. 
You have other dioceses that don't ordain women to any order of ministry. And then I think the majority of the ACNA will ordain women to the diaconate, but not to the priesthood. Um, and then there's no, uh, there's no ordination of women to the episcopate or to bishops. Um, so the, the Anglican diocese of the South, which we're in, takes sort of that majority view of we have female deacons, but not female priests. Does that answer your question? Okay. Other questions? Isn't that a fundamental difference between the Anglicans and the Episcopalians where they'll ordain uh, women to any position? Um, it, it's definitely a, a pretty big difference. Yeah, the, in the Episcopal Church, um, they, they open up ordained ministry to a much uh, larger group of people. Um, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. It's a it's a very it's a very different standard. I'm sorry, that was just a nice way to put that. That's right. <laughs> so any other questions, comments? Anything was confusing? Well, all right. Well, thanks wait, wait, for wait, 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 oh. one question. One, yes. one question. And, and this has been the thing that's been confusing to me for the longest time. And I'm like, okay, I need to find you to ask this question. So I guess now is a good time. Oh. Um, what is the difference between an archdeacon and another canon besides the fact that, I mean, so what's mm -hmm. the difference between an archdeacon and a canon? Since right. Canons are those who are appointed with special like duties by the bishop, mm -hmm. and an archdeacon is also a priest, but it seems to be a senior priest within yes. in the diocese that support. Right. So, so a deacon um, or a, an archdeacon versus a canon. A canon uh, oftentimes their role is very specific, um, whereas an archdeacon has much it's it's much more of a, a general authority kind of thing um so within within a dots we have um what we would call what we call deaneries or convocations which are groups sort of geographical regions within the geographical region and each um, convocation will have a dean um mm -hmm. and so the the role of a dean is is often what that role of an archdeacon would be um, gotcha. now coming from nigeria i will say they they love their titles and so there are a lot of archdeacons there um and a lot of canons in uh in nigeria so um but that tends to tends to not be an american thing you don't have a lot of american archdeacons thanks all right anything else um, I thought of a question while you were yeah, going through the different, uh, while you were going through all the different structure and um, layers there are within each diocese down to mm -hmm. each parish. You know, it seems it's very orderly. It makes sense, um, and that that all made sense. I was just curious, like how how like financially independent and like structurally independent <laughs> is each particular parish? Mm -hmm. Like, how does that work within such a coming from an evangelical background, yeah. this is a very elaborate structure. How does yes. this all work? Um, well, because the ACNA is, is pretty brand new, we're only, I think we're in our 11th year as a, as a body. Um, so there's not a lot of money to go around. And so for the most part, each, each parish is financially responsible for itself. Um, so there's not a money from, the from the parish goes to the diocese so we have a 
just as parishioners make a pledge to the parish, the parish makes a pledge to the diocese. Um, so and it's it's not a required pledge. Um, so we're not we're not made we're not given an assessment uh, like in some denominations. Um, but it, it's expected that we will give, and the expectation is ten percent. Um, I think a lot of churches will do five percent. Right now, I think we do five percent to the diocese, and I think five or six percent to mission and and other outside ministries. Um, but we, our plan is to move that up till we get to a ten percent gift to the diocese. And then that money is used to kind of run the diocese and pay for the bishop's travel and things like that. Uh, but there's not a there's not a whole lot of money that filters down from the diocesan level to the parish level. Uh, in a church like the Episcopal Church, which was much older and had a lot more money, um, oftentimes the diocese would help to fund uh, mission congregations. Um, but the ACNA right now, we just don't have a lot of extra money for that. Uh, our convocation is hoping to eventually become our own diocese. So we will become the diocese of the Mid-South. And we're hoping to be able to use a lot of diocesan money to do church planting. Um, but a lot of this is still really new and we're still figuring it out. We're, we're building the plane as we fly it, so to speak. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for joining me. It's been fun. And uh, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. I thank you for all who have gathered. And I pray that you would be with us all in this coming week, that you would keep us safe, that you would continue to provide for our needs and that you would reunite us in joy at the right time. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, it was great seeing you guys. Let us know if you, any, you need anything, and we will see you soon. All right. See you. Bye.